What's happening, you bad motherfuckers? It's Monday, February, I don't know what the fuck it is. The joint is brought to you by Manscaped. Listen, we're in the dead of the winter here, folks, with nothing to fucking do. It's time to get your fucking snowblower ready for some heavy fucking plowing. Tell your lady she's going to see more fucking dick than she does on you fucking porn, because it's all over. Manscaping is fucking what's happening. Get the Manscaped Performance Package. You're like, Joey, what are you talking about, a performance package? Fucking lawnmower 3.0, the best hair trimmer known to mankind. If you care about your balls, you should know about the lawnmower 3.0. It's the only ball trimmer with the advanced skin safe technology that won't nick or snag your poor little fucking nutsack. Have you ever sat there trimming your nutsack and the hair on your dick? You know how much fucking anxiety it gives me? You gotta look up and pray. You don't trust nobody with it. You can't. That's your fucking dick can you imagine you go to the hospital the my girlfriend was trimming my fucking ball hair and my ball fucking fell off you know they'll laugh at you that's why fucking manscaped is fucking manscaped the best the lawnmower 3.0 it protects your fucking snowballs plus with the fucking manscaped performance package they'll throw in the crop preserver and the crop reviver you're like joey what, what is that for it keeps everything smelling fresh you understand me you see my healthy glow i drink this fucking shit i put it on my face that's how good the crop reviver and the crop preserver is you know you ever look at your nutsack it's all wrinkly it looks like a fucking prune with the crop preserver if you use them both in unison after your shower, your balls look tremendous, nice and shiny. It's like, it's like fucking, I don't even know what to fucking describe it. And my favorite is the crop mop ball wipes. I'm all out of them because I got stinky balls. You know what I'm saying? So before I throw out my ball sack, I got to wipe them down with the little crop mop ball wipes. No one's getting a whiff of these nuts unless Manscaped has got there first. But wait, there's more. Clean out your fucking stinky nose hairs and your fucking snots with the weed whacker. That's exactly what I did after I found that fucking half a fucking pound snot in my nose last fucking Monday. You won't believe what you'll find up there when you put the weed whacker in your fucking nose. Snots, pu pubic hairs, old asshole dust. It's a fucking nightmare. And now you can top it all off with their new cologne named Refined. Like a fine wine. A gentleman always cares about his fucking nuts. They got it all. They got you covered. Nobody treats your balls as good as Manscaped. Maybe fucking your uncle. I don't, I don't know. I'm just fucking saying. Nobody treats your balls better than fucking Manscaped. So right now, get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com slash show. Again, that's 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com slash Joey. Take care of your nuts. Take care about that area. You ain't got much going for you, but you got a dick. You might as well take care of it. The joint is also brought to you by, speaking of dicks, Blue Chew. That's one thing you can count on in the world. Blue Chew for a harder, stronger erection. A big fucking dick. Combat all forms of ED. Blue Chew brings you the first chewable dick pill. Same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis at a fraction of a cost. This isn't that fucking rhino horn shit. Your buddy got you in Ecuador. This is fucking science. You understand me? And it ships right to your door in a discreet package. Not even your fucking mailman knows what it is. Blue Chew tablets are made in the USA and they're prepared and shipped direct. It's cheaper than a pharmacy. And they got a special deal for you. You ready for this? Grab a pen. Try Blue Chew for free. For free. Joey, what are you talking about? Free. Free with promo code Joey at checkout. Just pay $5 for shipping. That's right. Go to Blue Chew. B-L-U-E-C-H-E-U dot com. Promo code Joey to receive your first month for free. And as usual, I want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the joint. Now, without further ado. Let's get this motherfucking party started. You know what I'm saying? It's Monday morning. We got shit to talk about. Hey, how you doing? Come on in. Hey, 
who it is. What's happening? Check one, two. Welcome to Uncle Joey's Joint. What's happening, you bad motherfuckers? Welcome to Uncle Joey's Joint. It's Monday, I think it's the 22nd. It's Julius Irving's birthday. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know who's fucking... Son. It's, got, it's always somebody's birthday. I know it's my niece's birthday. Uh, what the fuck is her name? Ava. That's what her name is. It's her birthday. Today, I want to wish her a happy birthday. I know she don't, she don't watch the podcast. What's happening, you bad motherfuckers? For starters, thank you very much for all the birthday uh, wishes and stuff. I had a great time. Uh, I didn't do much. Uh, a couple people came over. We ate a fucking Carvel cake, you know. Like two people came over, the neighbors. We blew out the candles. Uh, my buddy Joe Rail drove me down to Uncle Vinny's. That was it. The f- Friday show was great. Saturday show was great. Uh, Saturday night, one of the guys, uh, what's his name? I want to give him a little shout out. He brought me a nice little present. Uh, what the fuck? I hate when I can't see without my fucking glasses. My man's name is Eric Lou. And Lori Friedland, I want to give him a shout out for dropping off some nice little presents for me. Lori dropped off some nice fucking cookies. I think they killed me last night. I ate both of them, nice little THC cookies. And Eric brought me a little uh, guest pass to Carvel, like a gift certificate for Carvel. I got like $9,000 in Carvel gift certificates. Did you know that? You know that that fucking Lee gave me one for a hundred fucking dollars? A hundred dollars at Carvel. I think I'm down to like ninety two fucking dollars since we've been here. I swear to God, who could eat a hundred dollars worth of fucking Carvel? Maybe when I was twenty, I could eat that much fucking Carvel, but now I can't eat that much fucking Carvel. I take a little. It was just a little bite. I feel guilty. Like I get all guilty that I'm gonna get diabetes and shit. So that's why I don't fuck around with sugar. But it was a great weekend, all in all. You know. uh, I was telling Mike before the podcast started, I just, I don't know about this fucking comedy stuff anymore. I love it, the whole thing, but I think that somewhere I met my match. I'm, you know, like I said, I'm, I got the whole, I got next Wednesday, which I'm excited about. I got the whole month of March at Uncle Vinny's, which I'm excited about. I'm going to see what type of writing I could get done, you know, with the book and everything else. You know, I'm writing, I'm doing a lot of fucking writing lately. And in the and, and it's just to get stories going, you know. I, I got a partner to help me with the book, Erica, and uh, it's, it makes my life a lot fucking easier because I'm, you know, this is not my genre. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, so I finally surrendered myself and got some help. That's what you do when you need help. So now what I'm doing is I'm just trying to write the crucial stories of my life. So when we get them, like I have like points. What were the, the, the turning points of your life? You know. So uh, I've been doing all that. So I got a lot of shit going on. But something happened Saturday night that I want to talk to you guys about. That this is just to show you that we're all very vulnerable to life and what's happening. I'm not fucking... I have nothing to fear. Like, I'm not scared of of a lot of things that most people are. I'm a married man, you know. Uh, I'm also a comic, you know. You go out, you do comedy. Part of comedy, when I got into comedy, yes, I enjoyed the drugs, I enjoyed the sex, I enjoyed, there was so much to fucking comedy that I enjoyed. It was what I I was cut out to do. I'm not saying that all comedians are are sex addicts or drug addicts or nothing like that. It was my thing, and I wasn't a sex addict. I just liked fucking going crazy, going out at night, drinking, getting high, and doing comedy, the whole fucking thing. Over the last three or four years, because of what's happened and the pandemic, you know, how you treat the opposite sex is very under a microscope now. At least it is for me. I had to make a conscious decision on, you know, like I have my friends, I have my Felicia's, I have my great Quigley's, I have my, you know, I'm, I'm friends with a lot of women. I, I, I talk to a lot of women during the week on the phone. I check in on them, you know, friends from, uh, crystal and it just there's just so many female comics that i'm friends with and we talk during the week blah 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 blah, blah. you know none around here i really the only woman comic i know in the neighborhood around here is bonnie mcfarlane who's married to rich voss i talk to her once a month if rich is on the phone and we're fucking cracking jokes and he'll go bonnie tell him you know but besides that i really don't 
to see any more female comics. The other night at Uncle Vinny's, Saturday night, Dino, the owner of the club, great guy, uh, comes in the back. It's me and my nephew, Jimmy Florentine, and the owner, and we're just bullshitting about the show, and, you know, uh, and Dino comes back there towards the end. We're getting ready to leave. It's just so fucking weird. And he goes, Joey, one of my friends is a dear friend of mine is here, and she'd like to meet you. Do you mind? Do you mind? I go, no, no, no. She's a friend of yours. Tell her to come back, you know? I mean, there's no pictures, nothing like that. There's no hugs or nothing. So it was funny because she came in the room, and then the room is a little, it's a small little fucking office. The green room, there's a, there's a couch and a couple chairs, and cute little place, you know, and... Dino walked out, and my nephew Luke walked out, who drove me. And then as the girl was walking in, Jimmy walked out. So now I find myself in a very uncomfortable comedic position that 20 years ago I would have been in. You know, I would have loved to have been in. A girl wants to meet you after a show. That's always fucking great. Anybody who wants to meet you is great after a fucking show. But with everything that's happened over the last fucking two or three or four fucking years with all the bullshit guys i fucking froze like i fucking froze she was a mom she was married she had two kids she had a two-year-old and a six-month-old she was attractive she she just moved from florida a couple of years ago she, she was a realtor she was very sweet she just wanted to say hello she was a fan of the comedy store she watched the documentary all that stuff but i didn't like I treated her fine. Like, I was great. I, we spoke, and I spoke to her. But the whole time, I couldn't feel like I couldn't be me. Like, I had to have my hands on my sides. Like, it's so weird what this has done to us as men and women, this whole fucking thing now, how we have to treat each other now. Like, you know, if this was three years ago when she would have come backstage, I would ask her to sit down. Do you want to smoke a joint? You know, blah, 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 blah. But because of all the fucking shit now, you can't. Like, I came home last, I came home Saturday night, and I fucking, like, it bothered me for a few minutes. I was making tea. Like, I make, like, like a little tea before, before I go to bed. I'm watching TV. My wife went away this weekend. The girls left on Saturday morning. They went tubing with a bunch of mothers in the neighborhoods. I, you know, I was alone. Uncle Vinny's, the show ends at fucking 9.30. We were home by 10.15, you know. So, I, you know, I came home. I cleaned up. I changed. I I uh, fed the cats. You know, I played with one of the cats. And then I thought about that. What it, You know, you always think about your set. I taped my set, so I was listening to it. Fucking, I had to turn it off after fucking eight minutes. But I thought about the girl and how I treated her. I treated her great. It was a great conversation. Then I went out front and spoke with her some more with Jimmy and Luke and Dean. We all and she had a girl with her. I thought she had a husband with her. I went out to meet her husband. She had a girl with her. I said hello to the girl. You know, the girl had two two because uh Uncle Vinny's is BYOB. So she had two beers to go. I'm like, you taking those to go? Jersey people don't fuck around. They take those beers with them. They bring them in. They bring them in and take them with them. We didn't, you know, we're not going to leave them here. We're taking them. So it was just weird. I was nice to her. I was very sweet to her. I was a gentleman. We had a great conversation. But it was just weird how the times are now limiting you on what you can and can't do anymore. Or at least in my eyes. I hope I'm, un I'm I hope I'm explaining this right to you guys. And I hope I'm coming through clearer to you. Like, I don't know if you're 22 right now or if you're 38 or if you're 44. You know, how do you date? How would you go up? What if I said to you, well, you know, well, I'd like to take you out. Of I don't even know how to ask them about it. Like, I, I had to sit there last. I was watching The Honeymooners. And I'm, I'm sitting there watching The Honeymooners. Thinking about how a, a Joey Diaz, a, a single Joey Diaz, could act in today's world if I was single. I wouldn't know where to start. Especially now that I don't do drugs. Like, if I had a, a drugless Joey Diaz, I don't know how to ask a girl out. I wouldn't even know where to start. Half the courage I got was from alcohol and drugs to ask a girl out. I wouldn't even know where the fuck to start on, you know, talking to a woman. It's the weirdest fucking thing that... 
all my life. I've had best friends that are women. I have friends in Colorado I still talk to. I have friends in L.A. I still talk to. I have girls in Jersey. Jesus Christ. I got like six best friends that are girls in Jersey. And for the first time in my life, the first time in my life, it, like I've had awkward conversations with women when you get divorced. That's an awkward conversation, you know. But this was an awkward conversation on my end. I felt that I was limited on being able to be Joey Diaz, and that sucks dick. Like, I wish I could have, you know, even a hug or how you doing or whatever. We can't do nothing anymore. Like, you got to feel like in your head that uh, somebody's going to take a picture of you. You know, like I said, I had to stop taking pictures of people at the hotel. Like, I won't take a picture with somebody at a hotel. There's no fucking way. There's no fucking way no more. If I'm in a hotel and I see, like, a girl come up to me and want to take a picture, you're out of your fucking mind. She could put that picture up and say, he took me here on Twitter and fucking, you know, did things to me. And I didn't do nothing. I was just checking into the hotel. You know, I started with that about a year ago when I was traveling with Dean and Kate. Like, listen, man, we're not taking pictures at the hotel. Because if you go to small towns, everybody knows you. If you go like the Pittsburgh Improv, the Dayton Funny Bone, there's certain hotels, you know, there's the only hotel in the town. If you play in Connecticut for like, let's say, uh, Uncle, uh, I forget the name of the club, you know, everybody knows that you're staying there. It's the only hotel in fucking town. So people come from other places to check in. And they're sweet people. I mean, I have nothing against them. They never bother me. They don't knock on your door. Nothing like that. But I'm just saying that what happens if you take a picture with a girl at a hotel, it says a Hilton, she could take it home and say whatever the fuck she wants. So this is how crazy it has become, you know. I mean, it just fucked me up totally. And I just wanted to talk to you guys about it because when it fucks me up, we got a problem. Like, I'm, like I don't want to do it. Like, I felt like I'm Zion Zari. Like what he got accused of, like that he didn't treat her right or whatever. Like that's what I felt like last night. Even though it was a great conversation and the whole thing, I just didn't feel like I could be myself. And that must be shitty for guys now that, you know, they feel that they can't. There's so many things with this cancel culture now that just fucking puts you, it has to make you aware of, of your actions in up to the up to the upscale minuscule of what comes out of your mouth because somebody will take it weird. You know, this cancel culture bothers me the most because what if you're a guy like me? What if you're a guy that's 27 years old, you make a fucking mistake, right? You you know, whatever. I'm just using kidnapping. Let's just say that right now. Times are hard, okay? Uh, You're not getting unemployment, but you have a friend who has weed, pills, coke, whatever, et cetera. I don't know. Let's say he says to you, you know, you can make money selling coke, all right? And you don't know what you're doing, but you do in a way. You know, you get a call, you drop the coke off. One day you make a mistake and you sell an eight ball to an undercover cop. I don't fucking know. I don't know what the laws are or whatever. You come out of fucking prison. You serve your fucking year and a half. You do your probation. You know, you get married. You have a kid. You do everything that's expected from you. But there's only one problem now. You went to prison. Is that a smack? Like, I was very fortunate that I went to prison and it rolled off me like a fireman's hat. Like, I didn't let myself get caught up in it. Okay? The reason why, because I knew I was dead. I always knew I was a loser. I knew that at that time. Let's just say at that time I was a loser. I knew I was dead, and I knew it didn't matter. I was going to get into comedy. But I'm talking about guys today that listen to this podcast, that watch Rogan, whatever. How about if you just got out of jail today? How would you feel? Would you want to go for it? To go to be a better person because people are going to say to you, hey, it doesn't matter. Ten years ago, you went to prison for fucking selling cocaine. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it's not, it's not worth the fucking aggravation for me to do something with my life because they're going to hold it against me. People are going to hold it against me. Every time I take two steps forward, somebody's going to say, hey, what are you talking about? You got charged for selling fucking cocaine. 
So do you understand where I'm coming from with this? This is what bothers me. The cancel culture, listen, if you want to get canceled, you get canceled. You could let them fucking cancel you. Or you could fight for your fucking life if you feel what you, that your actions or the allegations were wrong or they were incorrect or whatever the fuck. You have to fight. You have to say something to protect yourself. You just can't fucking sit there. But on the other hand, there's the psychological part of it. That little wind that goes through your mind. Because remember, everything starts with the flip of the switch. It starts with your mind. Your mind has to kick in. And your mind, your heart, and your soul all have to connect for you to make that fucking move in the right direction. But when you get something deep, deep, deep into your psyche that you go to yourself, why am I even going to try? Why would I want to go back to college and try to get a fucking degree if in fucking... Three years from now, somebody's going to throw up in the paper that I got arrested for fucking cocaine, even though you did your time. See, by me doing that time, for me, in my mind, I paid my dues. That's what it's called. You paid your dues. You got punished, and you did it. Now it's time to move on. It's like being a child. When I was a child, my stepfather didn't believe in hitting me. He would make me write, what did he call those things? I will not steal from the store. I will not steal from the store. Yeah, I will not steal from the store. I would have to do lines a thousand times. After I would do those lines, you're forgiven. That's it. It's fucking over. It's time to move on. Not anymore. Now you live in a country where you have to actually think about, oh, my God, I covered a girl's mouth at a fucking party in college in 1998 and in 2019 before I become a fucking Supreme Court fucking judge. She wants to raise a hand and say that I covered her mouth at a party in 1998. People have to look at that and go, Jesus Christ. What stupid things have I done in my life that they're going to call out on me? Why even get up? Why even try to better myself? You know, that is what I don't like about this whole fucking cancel culture. Is that people are going to be going, why should I fucking do anything? They're going to hold everything against me. When, when, when I went down with the fucking felony, when I got out of prison, yes, for two, three, four, five years, I lived very embarrassed. I was very embarrassed. It took me a while to finally come to grips with it and say, I'm moving on, and I'm going to become a comic. I said, comic, not big-time comic. I'm not going to become Kevin Hart. I'm not going to become Richard Pryor. I'm going to become a comic. That's all. That was my goal. How am I going to become a comic? Getting on stage, writing material, and just changing my lifestyle. And here we are, whatever, 30 fucking years later. But nowhere in that thing did I think that somebody was going to come back at me and go, well, you're not really a good comic because you got in trouble in 1987, 1988, which nobody has ever said because I've been very honest about it. I've been very honest about the details. I've been very honest about what happened, how it happened, and my state of mind. I have thought about this for years. This is... That was such a fucking, there's like 10 or 11 things in my life that I have reanalyzed and analyzed. I've done my own psychoanalyzation. I don't think I could have gone in front of somebody and could have said those things to them. You know, between the stand-up, the podcasting has helped a lot, and my thoughts and my notebook and psycho, I do my own. I want to know what made me say that. I want to know what made me do that. For the last 13 years, you know, besides comedy, beside my wife, beside anything else that's been going on in my life, I have in my journaling, there's also, I include in my journaling why I did these things. What made me do this? What made me do that? You know, I think that the addiction problem I had, when I had my addiction problem, it was all unresolved matters. Again, This goes back to mourning. This is just a different way of mourning. There's a couple of, a few types of things that I like mourning. I had to go back and psychoanalyze. Once I got clean from cocaine, I wanted to get to the root of that fucking thing. For no other reason, I wanted to get to the root to what the fuck was eating away at me that would make me want to do coke and pick up my face with a fucking tweezer and steal and fucking lie what would possess you what what is it is it dna 
Is it something, you know, so I dug deep within myself. While most people are learning about politics, while most people are fucking absorbing useless fucking information because 80% of the shit that we're absorbing is useless, we're just avoiding looking within and going, what the fuck made me call her that? You know, uh, I'm writing this book, you know, and I have to be honest. I'm, I'm writing a book with a girl, and I have to be totally honest with her on every level. I told her a story about when I went to court with my ex-wife, and at court, I beat her. One of the last times we went to court, it was about uh, they wanted to charge me with assault because I smacked her boyfriend because he called me a racial slur. Whatever happened, I'm not I'm not mad or anything like that, but after that situation, on the walk out of the courtroom, the judge told my ex-wife that if she ever didn't give me the kid, they would... Uh, you know, charge with contempt of court and all that shit. No big, no big deal. And I just went off on it. I started saying all these things that were lies. You know, uh, because of, you know, I was hurt. I was very, very hurt by the actions she had done. And I started saying a bunch of things to her in front of her husband to agitate her, agitate her husband, and just you know, I just it was just a childish thing. I was very immature. You know, now I see that at this age that I was very immature at that situation. I let I let my anger win, you know, cooler heads prevailed, and I said a bunch of things to her. This this occurred in nineteen ninety five. You know, I had won whatever. I think two months later is when I left Boulder. And you know, I thought about my daughter, I thought about my daughter, I thought about you know, everything I had done, going to prison, all this shit. But one of the things that ate away at me for years was what I said to my ex-wife while we were walking to that car. Even, listen, my ex-wife, the beef I had with my ex-wife was very simple, and I'll break it down to you guys. She moved my daughter in with a man without my permission, okay, without... And when I say permission, I don't, you're like, Joey, who the fuck are you? Not even permission. Just let me acknowledge that you're putting my daughter in with another man. Now, let me explain myself to you. If she would have done that to me in North Bergen, New Jersey, and I would have stabbed her, the cops would have came and said, you're good. Like in Jersey, we're good. Like a woman in Jersey taking your child and moving in with another man. I understand you don't love me no more. I understand you don't want to be with me no more. I understand all that. That's all part of growing up that we all have to face at one time or another. People do fall out of love. I get all that. But if she would have came to me and taken me for a cup of coffee, a nice tea, I don't give a fuck, a slice of pizza, and said, Joey, I met a man. I, I'm in love with him. You know, I know this is going to hurt you, but I, I'd rather be up front with you. I want to move in with him and start a family and move my daughter in with me. I'll tell you what. It would take me 10 days. I would have I got up, you know, I would have got up and told her to go fuck herself. It would have taken me 10 days, but then I would have gone, you know what? She came to me. She told me the truth. Guys, and if she would have said, you know, I'm telling you this, and then I want you to come over and check out the house, meet him for yourself, you know, it was like, give, give me a half a blessing. No, she didn't do that. That that disrespect ate at me to my core. That's a very disrespectful thing in my world. Maybe to you. It's okay to move your kid in with another girl or with another man if that's what you're into. For me, I felt it was very disrespectful. I felt it was, she had cut my legs off, you know. So, for years we spoke on and off, you know, after 2000, after 95, my wife and I spoke on and off, you know. I would call, I would just leave a message and go, you know, can Jackie call me 
or whatever. And then Jackie would call me. This was in L.A. in the beginning when me and my wife first started dating. And then they went to England. They took her out of the country and they went to England. And there was a long period we didn't talk. And then we talked again. And she that's when she told me, you know, um, I changed her name. There's nothing you could do. She doesn't want any contact with you, whatever. This was, This had to be like 2009, maybe. I don't know. Was it 2009? Yes, because she was just get going into college. So, you know, I, I waited a few years. You know, I, I, my feelings. You know, I was, I was, I don't know. I knocked my wife up in 2013, and after about two years, I just to show you guys the type of person I am. I called my ex-wife and I go, listen. Can you give me a call back? You know, she doesn't, have, she left this line open just so I could call. So if she ever, somebody ever says, well, you took him, her from Joey, she could go, no, we always kept this line. There's a certain line I call and then she'll call me back. You know, I, it's not written down. It's written in my fucking soul. You know, I called the number and I go, when you get a minute, can you call me back? And, you know, I had forgotten. I even left a message. She called me, and she's like, you do you know who this is? And I'm like, no. And she's like, shame on you. We were together for six years. You know, it, it, the conversation started off nicely. And I go, listen, before I say anything to you, I just want to tell you something. That conversation we had in 95 outside the police station when I told you that you like carrots in your ass, I mean, I said some fucking crazy shit to her in front of her husband. I go, I am deeply, deeply, deeply sorry. I didn't even talk about my daughter to her. I didn't, I didn't ask where my daughter was, nothing. I said, I just want you to know how embarrassed I feel about the words I said to you. I wish that you find somewhere in your heart to forgive me, you know, forget the kid and all this shit for my actions that day. And her reply was something, you were on drugs, it doesn't really matter. You know, she was just being a fucking bitch to me. But I know in my heart that I truly apologized to her. So I told this to Erica. I said, you know, that she goes, she was laughing all weekend about the story with the carrots and all that stuff. And I go, you know, as a man today, I feel very ashamed about that story. I had to write it out. You know, I had to write an apology to her. I never mailed it, but I felt so bad about that going off that till this day, I, I you know, I had to actually, what made me go off? Well, I, I had the right to go off. Let's get this straight because of what she did to me with the child. I had the right to go off. I didn't do anything bad to her for her to move. You know, that the parents lied to me. I would call, because she told me she was living with her mother. So I would call the mother, and the mother would go, she, they're not home. She's sleeping. They're in the shower. They went skiing. You know, she, this was going on for like a month and a half. So I had to find out the fucking rough way, you know. And it fucking hurt. It really hurt. And it, I mean, it cut my core. It didn't cut my core that she had gone with the guy. It had nothing to do with the guy. What bothered me was the disrespect and not telling me that she was moving my little three-year-old girl in with another man's house. So I, I, I hope that you find or understand where I'm coming from. I mean, nobody has the right to go off on anybody, but I want you to understand what she had done to me and what I had felt in my heart. All she had to do was just come up to me and say that. I, in, in the book... I'm putting the apology in there. Like, it bothered me so much that I searched for years on why I had said those things to her. Like, everything I do, I psychoanalyze over and over and over until I get that answer, and then I move forward. I'll get stuck on I mean, listen, the worst thing you could do as a man is think. I'm telling you this. Right now, it's the worst thing that you could do as a man is fucking think. It drives you fucking nuts. But you have to process things. You can't run away from that. You know, we were talking about that through morning last week, that I ran away from all my problems. I was one of those guys. Like, I, I run away. I, I'll deal with it later. You know, we'll deal with it tomorrow. No. 
No, no. You have to deal with it because if not, you're going to get stuck. And that's when the addiction starts. That's when the pain starts. That's when all that fucking shit starts. And I remember even, you know, I tell people all the time, like uh, people hit me up on Patreon or, you know, Facebook or Twitter. And they're like, you know, Joey, it's been a week since I haven't done drugs. You know, I'm, I'm really trying. And, you know, I always tell people the same answer. You know how many times I quit doing coke? 10,000 times. 10,000 times. It took me 10,000 times to quit for it to finally fucking stick. You got to keep trying. You're just not, you're just not going to stop doing it. You know what I'm saying? So you have to fucking try. I tried quitting Coke 10,000 times. I started quitting Coke in 2000 fucking one. You know, 2000. I remember still it being 1999 because I never got high on New Year's Eve. So the night, I never got, I, that was bad luck. I never wanted to be high on New Year's Eve to start the year off. I'm one of those fucking assholes. So I would always get high on the 30th. That would be my New Year's Eve because I always had shows on the 31st. So the 30th would be my last. I would I'd always be, this is it. This is the last time I'm going to do coke in 1998. This is the last time I'm going to do coke in 1999. I wanted to quit doing coke like since 1998 when I got into the comedy store. But that's how strong my addiction was. So what happened was for me to get off the fucking drug, that was my main thing. The comedy was going great. My relationship with my wife was men's and men's. I mean, we weren't married. We were boyfriend, girlfriend. But something wasn't right. So I had to psychoanalyze. So I would start anything... I fucking did. I started questioning my own actions over. Not doubting. Never a doubt. Questioning why I did that. Why did I steal this at this time? So before I got clean in 2007, like I was telling Erica, before I got clean, I had been struggling. Like it just, I just didn't quit. I didn't want to go to a rehab because I saw 20,000 different people go to rehab and nothing fucking happens because nobody could get to that core of you. You're the only person that could get to your own core. It would take a psychotherapist, again, a, a, a psychiatrist fucking eight years to get you off drugs through talking because you're peeling off the layers. You're peeling off the layers. You're peeling off the layers. And that's exactly what I did the other direction. And I figured out that it wasn't, like for me, when I was doing coke, what would make me do that every night? What pain that I have inside me? So I automatically threw it at my mother. I dumped my, my cocaine addiction on my mother. It was the pain from her death that caused that addiction. I started thinking about it, and I'm like, wait a second. She's been dead for fucking 10 years. She's been dead for 15 fucking years. She's been dead for 20 fucking years. How am I still fucking doing this? This is how, These are the things you have to do if you want to get clean and you want to move forward. If you're stuck like I was, a lot of people are fucking stuck in life. A lot of people are going to be stuck during this pandemic because everything sl slowed down. Everything fucking stopped. So once everything stopped, that gives you time to fucking think, which is horrible. You've seen what has happened by giving people time to think. Everybody, the statements, now Marilyn Manson's in trouble. Everybody's in fucking trouble. Everybody's remembering what's been done to them the last 20 years during a pandemic. When things stop, you start thinking. For me, I knew it wasn't the death of my mother, the reason why I snort coke. I knew it wasn't that, come on, I was fucking snorting up a storm before I got fucking married and before the little girl was taken away from me. What the fuck was the root of the cause of this, of me snorting coke? It was eating me alive. Every day I would take a time out from fucking, till today, every day I would put a little side apart of what, it was like a game show in my head. What makes Joey snort? I swear to God, it was called What Makes Joey Snort? And I would sit there and go, what the fuck would make me want to do this to myself? I used to have huge, if you look at, any video of me before 2007, I always had a pimple. 
I always had a gash on my face. There was always a gash on my face because I would get coked up and the hate. And see how some people cut themselves, some people slash. I did the opposite. I would take a tweezer and feel that there was a pimple in my face. And I would dig in and dig in and dig in until there was a hole this fucking big in my face. I swear to fucking God. So I looked at it as I'm not a slasher. I'm really a cutter. You know, this hatred that I have for myself is usually those people that cut themselves. You know, I went online and I read about it. I didn't tell anybody about my secret, about me picking my face. You saw it. when As soon as you see me, I would have a fucking pimple here. I would have a pimple here. I would have a fucking Band-Aid here because it was self-fucking mutilation. I hated myself. I fucking hated myself. I didn't know why, what was it? that fucking makes you want to do something like this to yourself. You know, I was too embarrassed to go to a psychiatrist. I was too embarrassed to go to my wife with this fucking problem. I was too embarrassed to go to anybody with it. I think I think I had too much pride, so I had to figure it out on my own. To be honest with you, I wanted to figure it out on my own. I didn't want anybody else to figure it out. I wanted to figure w- why I was fucking broken. And after fucking years one night, after I got clean from coke, I was doing journaling one night. And some nights, you'll be journaling, and something will come over you. And all of a sudden, it's like a power takes over your hand. After you're journaling for like 10 minutes, like, take a situation in your life. Take a, just journal about the eighth grade, my eighth grade experience. You know, I, I started the eighth grade out, blah, 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 blah. I enjoyed, I collected comic books. I was part of the Glee Club. You know, you write out the eighth grade. There'll be a part that when you're writing, your mind will break away of what you're thinking. And just you writing, like when you, you ever like listen to like Chris Cornell lyrics, the guy from Coldplay, all those guys are great lyricists. You sit there and you go, where the fuck did they get that lyric from? How did they, how did they come up with that lyric? They kept writing. They kept writing. They kept writing. And they touched their fucking soul like something. With me, it happens a lot with Chris Cornell. It happens a lot with the singer from Alice in Chains. There was a lot of singers. Uh, fuck nut from The Doors, Jim Morrison. You know, these are guys I admire because of their writing. But I think that sometimes when you do a lot of journaling and you're writing, something takes over. I don't know what to describe. You people are going to think I'm crazy. It's like a spirit. Something takes over and starts writing. And then you go back and you go, fuck, where did I get that from? I wasn't even thinking about that. I finally realized that the pain I had that was killing me, that I had never fucking processed. And we talked about this last week. And this is why I, I didn't get to it last week, but I wanted to get to it today so we conclude that conversation on morning. It was my father's death. In all my 11 years of podcasting, think about it. I've never spoken about my father's death. You can't find the podcast. I just say he died of a fucking heart attack. Well, today we're going to fucking tell you what really fucking happened. So you guys know what was eating away at Gilbert Grape all these fucking years. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) What was making Joey Diaz... Pick his fucking face. What was making me spend 80% of my salary? What was doing all these things to me was the death of my father. Me, I didn't want to do the work. See, I was like you guys. I didn't want to do the work. I just blamed it on the easiest thing. The death of my mother. A bad breakup. We always... Assume it's that big thing. In the back of your mind, you're like, oh, sure, I'm fucking getting high. I'm, I'm in pain. You know, my mother died. My father died. My brother got taken in a car accident. But there's something that led you to that bridge. You didn't just get to that bridge by itself. There's something that got you there. Yes, that um, that event is traumatizing and stuff. But there's, you know, like when there's an earthquake. There's always small earthquakes afterward. Aftershocks. Aftershocks. This is called before shocks. 
something happened before that that you didn't really process. We're going to talk about this a lot because I want, I think the big problem with us as human beings, especially now during the pandemic, is that we haven't gotten in touch with ourselves. This is what's helped me so fucking much as a human being. When people say to me, you know, what, dog, I'm telling you right now, yes, getting off the drugs was a big plus for me, the cocaine and all that shit. But the, the bigger angle for me was getting to know who I was and getting to know what made me tick. That's bigger than a college degree. That's bigger than a religious experience. That's the biggest thing you could do for yourself is finding out what really makes you tick, why you do the things that you do. So now it explains and now it makes your apology a lot easier to people. It may, I apologize to people all the time. I'm not, I'm a human being. I'm not fucking perfect by no means. I make mistakes. I live in my fucking head. I say weird things. So I have made, since I went to prison, I learned that I had to come to terms and I had to take responsibility for my fucking actions. You have to take responsibility for your actions, no matter how simple it is. So I became, I fell in love with the apology. I was such a fuck up that I fell in love with the apology. My dick gets hard when I look you in the eye and apologize to you. My dick gets hard when I look you in the eye and I can be honest with you. Sorry, I got an itchy fucking calf. It's so fucking dry around here that my fucking legs are all dry and shit. You know, my dick gets hard from apologizing to people. It makes me that much stronger. It pulls a huge weight off me. I've always, I did things early on in my life that I stopped doing. And then when I stopped getting high, I went back to that process. And it made my life that much easier. When I was a sophomore in fucking high school, right after my mother died, a girl came up to me one day, a really cute girl. Everybody loved this girl. They thought she was really hot. She came up to me and she said, hey, man, you have a friend that's really cute. I don't want to hook up with him, but I want it to be kept discreet. Is there any way we could do this? I go, we could do whatever, however you want to do it. She goes, I broke up with my boyfriend, and I don't want him to find out. I don't want anybody to find out. And I know your dear friends with him. Can you uh, hook me up with him? And I go, yeah, you know, for you, I'll do anything. She goes, and I'm going to do something for you. I'm showing up with a girl, so you could, uh, she just broke up with her boyfriend and she wants to hook up with you. Uh, do you, would you mind? Do you like her? What do you think of her? I'm like, do I like her? I think she's fucking beautiful. You know, she had broken up with her boyfriend. They had been broken up for about a month and a half. Now I was fucking 16 years old, 17 years old. Mother was dead already. Okay. Problems were already starting, but my main who my mother raised me to be was still intact at that time. She had just died, so it didn't really hadn't really affected me. I was just going on with my life. She had broken up with this kid, and the kid was a tough dude. The kid was a tough dude, and he was a good dude. That was the other thing about this. He was a good fucking dude. So I called the girl up. I go, listen, man, we're going to hook it up. Me and my buddy are going to meet you and her. You know, we'll get a car. We were young. I mean, you know, we were going to, like, get beers and maybe hang out and smoke a joint. It wasn't about sex. I mean, we, we, we were young. It was basically, I knew that the girl that I was going to hook up with, I knew she was having sex already because I knew her for a few years. She had a few boyfriends, and, you know, they were long-lasting relationships. You know, like, once she dated a kid, like, in the eighth grade for a year, and then in high school she dated another guy for, like, two years. She had broken up with that guy. When I, I called her that night, and I'm like, hey, we're going to do this, but before we could do this, I got to do something, and I'll call you back. So the next day at school, the kid's name was Fernando, rest in peace. I went up to him. He's like, hey, how you doing? I go, can I talk to you for a second? And he goes, what's up? I go, listen, man, I know that you and your girlfriend just broke up, but I've always had kind of feelings for him. His fucking face went pale. His fucking face went pale. I go, I have kind of feelings for her. And I hope that 
you don't mind if I take her on a date? And I told the kid, me and her, and, and, you know, it's a double date. I hope that you find it somewhere in your heart that you think it's cool. He went fucking pale. He was a Spanish guy, Latin machismo, you know, the whole thing. He's like, if I was you, I wouldn't fucking do it, and I would watch my fucking back, you know? And I go, wow, this is weird that by being honest, somebody gets mad at you. So by him saying, watch your back, that really fucking pissed me off. Like, I'm not like, now I'm going to have to fucking do it because the guy's threatening me. I'm trying to be a fucking man here at 16, 17, and this guy is telling me to watch my fucking back. So he was a year older than me. I'm like, all right, we'll see what fucking happens. Something happened. My, I think my mother died, and we, we, me and that girl were supposed to hook up that night uh, the week before Halloween, like a week before Halloween, and that was the night that I stayed out late, and my mother smacked me when I got home at 6 in the morning. She ended up at a different party. We never hooked up. So after my mother died, that kid came to my mother's wake, and he goes, can I talk to you for a second? He goes, hey, man, I threatened you that day. I want to take it back because I didn't realize what you were doing. You came up to me like a man. Most guys don't even have the balls to do what you did. You came up to me like a fucking man and asked me if you'd go out with her on a date. He goes, I'm sorry about your mom, and you have my blessing. Take her out. And we didn't hook up till years later. I mean, but this is, and let, let me tell you this. Me and that guy stayed great friends. For years, every time I came to Jersey, he would come to all my fucking shows. And maybe a year and a half ago, he passed of a heart attack. I sent uh, his wife flowers and a card and some help. And we stayed friends because that's how I was raised. You talk. You ask permission. You talk to people. You know, you can't move in my fucking child with some fucking stranger and not fucking tell me. So that was what I was pissed off about all those years. But as I was saying to you guys before, I'm going to talk to you about the death of my father, and then we'll wrap it up. I know I've had you here for a little while. I've never told this story, and I'm going to tell it to you guys right now. My father was born in Cuba, came to the States early, and he connected with a bunch of Jewish guys on the Lower East Side. There's a book called The Something Connection. I got it outside. I have to go get it. It's, a, it's one of my favorite books I've ever read because somebody pulled me aside when I was a kid one time and told me that those were my dad's friends. It's two Jewish guys in there. And that it was a long story. But what happened was this. I always tell people that my father died of a heart attack. My father did not die of a heart attack. My father died of a heroin overdose, and it wasn't a heroin overdose. He thought he was doing a line of coke, and it was pure heroin. And when he did the line of fucking heroin, it just, he went into a coma. He had, you know, it was just too much heroin to put up your fucking nose. He thought it was coke. It was 1966, and he was Union City's first Cuban committee man. So he went into the bathroom. Somebody gave him a package. They thought it was fucking Coke. He went into the men's bathroom, did a line. He came out, and he collapsed, and he started vomiting. He went into a coma, and they took him to the fucking hospital. At the hospital... He died of an overdose, but they couldn't fucking say that. So they said he died of a heart attack in the newspaper, and they never signed his his uh, death, certificate. death certificate. And my mother had to ship the fucking body back to Cuba in a rush before, you know, the autopsy results were whatever. Nothing ever came from it. I've always told people it was a heart attack, you know, uh, I found the obituary, you know, looking through my mother's stuff, and it said heart attack. All the obituaries said heart attack and stuff, but uh, my mother sat me down one day. It wasn't even my mother who sat me down one day. I told you guys that I had a family in Miami, the, the Castrillones, Rodolfo. I love him. You know, Rodolfo was like my uncle to me, and it was him who told me the story. You know, every summer I would go down there and spend the summers with him. 
and he would treat me better than his fucking kids, you know. And I would spend three weeks with them every fucking summer. Two weeks at the house where I would work, and then the third week, my mother would come down, and she'd join me, Rodolfo, Vivian, and the three kids. And we'd go to, like, Miami Beach, and we'd spend the fucking week, and, you know, it was great. The point is, he treated me like a fucking better than a son. And one day in 1976, the summer, I I remember the summer because it was the summer the Eagles came out with one of these nights. That's one of my favorite fucking jams of all time. Uh, The Eagles came out with that song, One of These Nights, and I met a girl down there in uh, Miami, Rebecca and Natasha. They were two sisters, and I fell in love with one of the sisters, and, you know, we were calling back and forth. And anyway, the point of the story is this, that, I asked him once, he was going, he was, I was about 11 in 76, I was 13, and I went down there, and he pulled me aside one day, and he goes, can I talk to you about something, and he goes, I don't know if you know this, I don't know if your mom has told you, I didn't want your mom to tell you, but do you want to know the reason I treat you the way I do? Because I asked him once, I go, because he always always tell me, I love you more than the sun. I asked him, why do you always say those things to me? He goes, I'm going to tell you something. Your mom's going to be mad at me, but I'm going to tell you the story anyway. He goes, on the night that your dad died, they were having a party at the bar. He goes, I lived three doors down at that time. Me and my wife lived three doors down from you, your dad, and your mom. We were always together. We knew each other since Cuba. We reconnected in the States and were best friends. He goes, I had to do something the next day. Like, I, I, he had to do, like, a meeting. He had, like, some meeting. He was a big outdoor boat guy. He was a big boating guy, this Cuban guy. And he had to do something with a boat. So he, owned, he owned, like, a boating company down the shore somewhere in Jersey. I, I don't know the details. But he was starting to tell me the story. He goes, let me tell you what happened. They were having a party at the bar for your father. Because my birthday is the 19th. My father died February 26th. This Friday will be his 51st anniversary. No. If he died when I was three, it's his 55th anniversary. This Friday or the 26th, whatever. Yeah, Friday. So he pulled me aside one day when we were sitting there, and he goes, you want me to tell you why? Because I'm responsible for your father's death. I go, what are you talking about? My father died of a fucking heart attack. He goes, no. He goes, we were kids. We didn't know what was going on. We were doing cocaine, and I fucking, I knew my mom did coke. But Rodolfo was such a straight fucking guy, construction company, nice house, you know. He's telling me this. He goes, when we were kids, we used to do fucking coke in 19 fucking 66. Can you imagine that shit? My dad was 37 years old. That's why I never thought I would live over 37 because my dad died at 37. So he goes, they were having a party, but I had this big event the next day I had to do and I had to be there on time. I had to be clear eyed and I couldn't drink that night. So they kept calling me from the bar saying, Rodolfo, come over. There's a fucking tremendous party. There's broads, all this shit. There's coke. And Rodolfo kept saying, no, 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 I'll hang up on it. I guess at some part of the night, they gave somebody gave my dad an aluminum foil. And my dad went into the bathroom and he came out and he vomited. They called him first. And they said, Rodolfo, Hurry up over here. Manolo's in trouble. He did a line of coke, and he, he had a heart attack. And he's like, fuck you guys. You guys are just playing games with me. That's not a, that's a fucking lie. Bye. And he kept hanging up. And they kept calling him, saying, Rodolfo, fucking hurry up. Come over here. He's dying. We don't know what to do. My mother was calling him. We don't know what to do. And he's like, knock it off already. Stop calling here. Manolo's fine. And he kept hanging up. The next morning, he woke up, and somebody told him Manolo died last night. And he said that he didn't make it to his meeting, that he cried for, like, fucking two days. He did all the events with my mom. And and then they went in search of to see who had given him that cocaine, that certain cocaine. Because once they found it in his pocket, once the cops came or whatever, 
they were like it was heroin. There was this is why I never. I always made myself a promise as a kid that I was going to do drugs. Like you know, that if I ever did get into drugs, I would be okay. But I would never do fucking heroin. After my mother died, I did heroin with Gunter Brown. I did heroin a couple times in prison, and I did heroin in 2007 before I cleaned off the coke. I was snorting and I never shot it. But that's what bothered me the most about heroin because my father died of heroin. So when before I quit the fucking coke and I realized that it wasn't my mother's death that had bothered me, it was my father's death that I had never mourned. I had never really remembered my father. So I went on an all-night, you know, I went on an all-out brigade to find out who my fucking father was. I had an investigator. He got me all this information, and it put me more at peace. This is back in 2007. I think Joe Rogan gave me the money to pay the investigator. To f- I never told him what it was for, for me to find out what had happened to my father. Uh, they buried him, whatever it was, an overdose. Because years later, somebody pulled me over and said he got shot. And I'm like, now you want to fucking... So I had to call around and ask around. I asked my uncle. My uncle was, my uncle was like, no. My mother's brother was like, no, I was there that night. I saw him go into the bathroom. I saw it all go down. It was very fucking sad. Till this day, we don't know who gave him the aluminum foil. And that was it. Once I figured out that it was my father's pain that kept me doing coke, I stopped in 2007. Once I identified what the pain was from, for years, I blamed it on my mother, Anthony Balzano, and Dominic Special. I blamed it on those three deaths all at one shot. But after that, it wasn't that. It was the death of my father that I had never processed it. And once I processed it and I hired the investigator and I found where he was buried in Cuba and everything, one day I just got off the fucking coke just like that. And that's the fucking podcast for today. How's that, motherfuckers? I've never told that story. I was very ashamed to always tell that story. Very fucking ashamed. I never told it to my friends. I never told it to anybody. So after the last week, the podcast about mourning... I figured, why am I lying to these people? Let me finish that out and tell them the story on how I really got fucking clean and sober from cocaine. Yeah, to some, I, I read on IMDb, I read on fucking Wikipedia that one of my cats ate the coke and they OD'd. I don't know who wrote that in there. Whoever wrote that in there, you should be shot and hung. What really happened was I went upstairs and I had two cats in the bathroom that were dying and my wife was taking care of him. One of them died. The other cat I hated with all my heart. His name was Super Bad. When my wife told me that DJ had died, I told her to close the door, please. I just go close the door. I can't take it. And then I go, I'm stuck with that fucking Super Bad. He's going to fucking... And I said to myself, wait a second. I have eliminated all the problems in my life. I found out. What the fuck was bothering me? It was the death of my father. This is the perfect opportunity. I opened up the kid, the bed, the bedroom door. I went into the bathroom. Super bad. The cat was laying on the floor. My wife had put two towels on the floor with food, and they were they had a, anemia. I guess if your cat lives outside, they get anemia or some shit like that. I fucking got up. I went into that bathroom, I closed the door, I got on my hands and knees, and I said, God, if you save this cat, as much as I hated that cat, I didn't like Superbad because he came from a litter of four, and there were three Siamese's and Superbad. And the three Siamese's, I still got two of the girls, and Superbad uh, DJ was his brother. He was also Siamese. Their mother was fucking two cats at once. She was fucking the samurai, and she was fucking the black and white big cat. So they both got her pregnant. She had like a mixed fucking load. So she had three Siamese cats and one super bad cat, like one black and white cat. I didn't like him because he would make DJ 
the one I, DJ was Demi Jr. I was going to bring him upstairs in a couple of weeks. I was going to break it to my wife in 2007. But fucking, I, I wanted the cat to get bigger before I brought him up. You have to wait a certain amount, eight weeks, ten weeks. I don't fucking know. So every time I look outside, fucking super bad would be on top of a tree with Demi and I and uh, DJ, and I would go fucking DJ, come down here, and DJ would come down, and super bad would stay up there, but super bad would make DJ do crazy things because he was a crazy cat. So I was like, one day I'm gonna fucking kill this fucking cat, this super bad cat. I didn't like super bad because I like DJ, but I had DJ and super bad in the fucking bathroom. My wife had him in the bathroom when she came to me and told me that DJ died. I was like, God damn it, I love that fucking cat. Sure, fucking super bad, fucking live. The cat I don't fucking like. And I go, whoa, 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 what am I fucking saying? I got up, I went into the fucking bathroom, I got on my hands and knees, and I pet this cat as much as I didn't like him. He wasn't even purring, he was three quarters dead. I was petting him, petting him, petting him. And I said, God, if you let this cat live, I will never fucking do cocaine again. Never, ever again. Now, between us, I knew I was bullshitting. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, between us, I knew I was bullshitting. I had lied to God. I had made a thousand promises to God before that I never came through on. Like, this is just a bullshit story, you know? I looked at that cat, and I petted it, and I said, God, if you let this fucking cat live... I will never touch a fucking grain of fucking salt. Never, never even look at cocaine again. I got up and I'm like, whew, I hope that fucking works. You know, let's see if that promise comes true. Well, let me tell you something, man. Like I said, 14 days later, I couldn't fucking believe it. 28 days later, I couldn't believe it. Three months later, I couldn't believe it. And now, 13 years later, I'm sitting here in front of you telling you that I quit cocaine over a fucking promise to God that a cat would die. And Superbad's dead. He died last year. He died uh, two years ago, December 17th of 2019. I miss him, but it was a promise to a fucking cat and me fucking getting to the heart of the matter. The pain, because you got to root out that pain. Don't blame it on that one thing. It's not that one thing that you're blaming it on. It's something that happened before that, that you never really, it bothered you, you didn't process it, and then something else happened, and together they became painful. Do you know what I'm saying? So if you got any pain that you need to get rid of, again, I'm sick and tired of telling people, I answer these questions every day on the platforms, Get that fucking notebook and write it out. You don't need to see a therapist. You don't need to see nothing like that. You could get to the heart of the fucking problem all on your own. You just have to be fucking strong enough and be willing to peel back the fucking layers like a banana. You got to keep going in there, keep going in there, keep going in there and going, what the fuck is wrong with me and why am I fucking broken? And your problems will fucking disappear. I'm not saying I don't have no problems today. But pain-free, I'm fucking done with pain. That pain that makes you want to do stupid shit, and I have been done with it. It took me 44 years to fucking figure out how to deal with it. I'm going to save you 20 fucking years if you do what I fucking tell you. I'm not like I'm no Anthony Robbins or nothing like that, but I'm telling you that it worked for me. So if you got a pain, if you can't stop drinking, if you can't stop doing coke, if you can't stop doing pills, and you know you're in pain, not like physical pain, but something is bothering you inside, don't go with what you think is that process. Think a little deeper. Go a little harder. You know, that's what a psychiatrist does. They peel off the fucking layers for you. You could do it on your own with a notebook And it feels a lot better because it's just yourself. You worked out the equation on your own. And that's the podcast for Monday, February 22nd. It's a beautiful day to be fucking alive. 
I want to thank all you guys for watching. This wasn't the most entertaining podcast of the year, but I wanted to finish off the conversation from last week, from morning. Uh, I want a, a little R.I.P. to Brody. I think this is his anniversary also of dying this week. I didn't want to do a podcast about Brody and a podcast about Ralphie. It would have been too much death. But my heart goes out to Brody's family. My heart goes out to Brody's bench. My heart goes out to Mauricio Alvarado for putting the park bench together and the whole thing. And I also want to thank, uh, I don't want to thank, I also want to send much love and light to my father, who's been dead 55 years this fucking Friday. I love you guys with all my heart. You know, if you got a problem, fucking, you don't need to call anybody. You know exactly where to go. To tap in to yourself. Tap into your soul. Get a notebook and start fucking writing. And hopefully you'll feel better, you'll feel great, and you'll stop doing the stupid shit that you do. For me, it was very hard doing this podcast a day and telling you guys about the fucking cutting. I never cut myself. I would just pick myself and telling you that my father died as a junkie. It was very hard to do it, but that's what this podcast is about. It's about the truth and getting it out there and for us to learn something from one another. Thank you very much for watching. I want to thank fucking uh, Blue Tube. I want to thank Manscaped. And I want to thank you guys for watching. Have a great week. And I'll see you guys Wednesday. Tip top motherfucking Magoo. Stay black, cocksuckers. Yo, before we leave, I also want to thank my future brother-in-law, Steve, for making me a little fucking statue of Uncle Joey. I don't fucking know, but it looks good. And I appreciate the hard work he put into it. I don't fucking know. I don't know. I think I'm a little bit more handsome than this motherfucker. But it's Uncle Joey's joint, bitch. And I want to thank you personally, Steve, my future brother-in-law. Thank you. All right, you bad motherfuckers. Thank you for taking the time out on a Monday morning and listening. I know you got a lot of shit on your plate. Thank you for taking the hour, you know, whatever the fuck it is. Before I go, I want to thank a few people. For starters, Blue Chew. Listen, there's one thing you can count on in this world. Blue Chew for a harder, stronger erections. I'm not saying that you got ED. This combats all forms of ED. But listen, even if your dick works right, why not go in there with some extra fire, firepower, right? Blue Chew brings you the first chewable dick pill. Same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis at a fraction of the cost. This isn't that fucking bullshit they bring you, you know, uh, this is from a kangaroo's asshole. Snort this. This will make your dick hard. Go fuck yourself. When I, when I show up with Blue Chew, I'm blowing up. I'm showing up with fucking science, cocksuckers. Blue Chew is an online prescription service. No visits to the doctor's office. No awkward conversations. No waiting online in a pharmacy. The process is fucking simple. You sign up at BlueChew.com. You consult with one of their licensed providers. And once you're approved, booyah. You receive a little prescription within days right at your door. It ships right to your door in a discreet package. There's not going to be an envelope with a big black dick on it. Nothing like that to embarrass you. Not even your mailman knows. Blue Chew tablets are made in the USA, and they're prepared and shipped directly. It's cheaper than going to a pharmacy. Save time, aggravation, embarrassment. And you know what? Be a better lover. They're gonna. You want them to call you back, right? You got to show up with a fucking nice, hard, big dick. And they got a special for you right now. Blue Chew. Try Blue Chew for free. For free. Who else does this? You think I'm going to show up with some fucking Susquehanna shit? Use promo code Joey at checkout. Just pay $5 for shipping. That's it. BlueChew.com, promo code Joey, to receive your first month free. Free, free. I'm showing up on a Monday with some for free, suckers. I want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the joint. But right now, go to BlueChew.com, press in Joey, and get a month for free. 
Let's start the week off like that, all right? Who, who else shows up with something for free on a Monday? Fucking nobody. The joint is also brought to you by Manscaped. Listen, you're stuck in the fucking house. It's freezing to death. You can't masturbate all fucking day and stick fingers up your ass. You got to go fucking for brokey, all right? You're going to go on a date. You went out last weekend for Valentine's Day. Did you, did you take care of yourself? When I'm talking about taking care of yourself, I'm talking about Manscaped, cocksucker. The best. It comes, the lawnmower 3.0. The best fucking ball trimmer known to mankind. It's the only ball trimmer with the advanced skin safe technology that won't nick or snag that beautiful fucking nutsack. You've seen my nutsack. You know it's fucking beautiful. Don't sit there and make believe you don't know what I'm talking about. Protect your fucking family jewels. Protect those balls of death. Plus, if you get the Manscaped Performance Package, that's the only way to go. You got to get the whole package. You just can't get the, the lawnmower 3.0. You're wasting your time. I want you to do a complete overhaul on your nutsack dick pole. You understand me? They also throw in what's called the crop preserver and the crop reviver. It keeps everything smelling good, fresh. It's It fucking takes the wrinkles out of your nutsack. You look at my, you see me lately, how healthy my glow is? Why? I fucking put it on my face. I don't give a fuck at this point anymore. I'm 58. I got one foot in the grave and one on a banana peel. But my favorite is the crop mop ball wipe. You put it right in your little wallet. It's a little package. And just in case you bump into somebody who wants to suck your dick, you're prepared. You say, give me a minute, you turn around, you pee in the bush, you wipe your little ball sack and your dick and your little helmet with the thing, and you fucking throw it away and let the fucking guy down the corner when he picks up the dog shit, pick it, use that to fucking pick up. I don't give a fuck. The crop mop ball wipes are tremendous. Nobody is getting a whiff of my nuts unless Manscaped has gotten there first. And I've been with Manscaped for years. But wait, there's more. Clean out your stinky fucking nose hair with the weed whacker. You saw last week that snot I fucking had. As soon as I fucking finished, I ripped that fucking snot out and I weed whacked my fucking nose. No more fucking snots. And now you can top it all off with their cologne name Refined. Tremendous fucking. So I don't. I, I wish I knew French so I could describe like saint je ne sais quoi. When you use refined, fucking a gentleman always cares for his fucking grapes. You understand me? That's how fucking tremendous it smells. They got you covered when it comes to your nutsack and your dick pole over at Manscaped. So do me a favor. Go to manscaped.com slash Joey. Manscaped.com slash Joey. Take a look at what they got. Take a look at the 3.0. Take a look at the fucking Weed Whacker and get 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com slash Joey. Again, that's 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com. I want to thank Manscaped. I want to thank Blue Chew. But most importantly, I want to thank you fucking animals for giving me uh, your Monday, an hour of your fucking time. And letting me fucking talk shit. You guys are my fucking psychiatrist. I love you guys to death. Have a great fucking week. And I'll see you on Wednesday. Ready to go. Tip top motherfucking Magoo. I love you cocksuckers. Be safe. <laughs>